Peace be with you. Welcome back, brothers and sisters. Welcome to Jesus via Mary. The best, surest, and the quickest way to the sacred heart of Jesus is through his mother, the Blessed Virgin, the Immaculate Conception. She's our mother, too. Mary, our mother. Let's begin with a prayer. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that any one who fled to your protection, implored your help, or sought your intercession was left unaided. Inspired with this confidence, we fly unto you, O Virgin of Virgins, our Mother. To you do we come, before you we stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, Despise not my petitions, but in your mercy, hear and answer them. Amen. My friends, our program today and all of our future programs, which are brought to you by Mary's Littlest Children, is dedicated to St. John Paul II. My friends, we previously consecrated our ongoing weekly program to the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Immaculate Conception the mother of God. Now we, Mary's littlest children, briefly renew that consecration with these words. Totus tuus ego sum, et omnia mea tuus sunt. I am all yours, Immaculata, and all that I have is yours, including, and especially, this radio program entitled, Jesus via Mary. Before we begin, brothers and sisters, I encourage you to keep a pen and paper handy, unless you're driving a vehicle, to jot down some information that we'll give you later on in the program. There's bound to be something of interest to you. We'll also give you a link whereby you can access all of our programs, past, present, and sometimes even future, in order to catch up on things if you wish. As you probably know by now, our email address is to Jesus via Mary at AOL.com. And you can write to us at any time with questions or comments. We only ask that you do so with respect. Today we're going to talk about the Eucharist, the true presence of Jesus Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Holy Eucharist. We'll also discuss the vital importance of Eucharistic adoration, especially perpetual adoration. Perpetual meaning 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, ongoing. We have a lot to cover, so if we do not finish today, we'll continue and wrap up in our next program. I'm anxious, however, very anxious to begin talking with you about what St. John Paul II referred to as the new and divine holiness with which the Holy Spirit wishes to enrich Christians at the dawn of the third millennium, and we are now in the third millennium, so as to make Christ the heart of the world. Let's begin with the Eucharist. The following words are from Pope St. John Paul II. These are taken from his encyclical entitled Ecclesia De Eucharistia, which was issued on April 17, 2003, and it has to do with the Eucharist and its relationship to the Church. The Church draws her life from the Eucharist. This is the opening sentence of John Paul's encyclical. On the Eucharist and its relationship to the Church, John Paul is speaking here not just about the regular experience of faith that we know from our participation in the daily and Sunday Eucharistic liturgy, but about the very heart of the mystery of the Church. The mystery of faith, the Pope reminds us, is that it was Jesus who instituted the Eucharist, which is the memorial of the Lord's death and resurrection. The sacramental re-presentation of Christ's sacrifice crowned by the resurrection in the Mass 
involves a most special presence, which, in the words of Pope Paul VI, is called real, not as a way of excluding all other types of God's presence, as if they were not real, but because it is a presence in the fullest sense, a substantial presence whereby Christ, the God-man, is holy and entirely present. The origins of the Eucharist are found in the Last Supper. In order to give us a pledge of his love and to be with us always, Jesus made us sharers in his Passover and instituted the Eucharist as the memorial of his death and resurrection. He also commanded the apostles to celebrate it until he returned. At the Last Supper, Jesus instituted the new memorial sacrifice. The true Lamb of God was about to be slain. By his cross and resurrection, he was to free not just one nation from the bondage of human slavery, but all of humanity from the bitter slavery of sin. The faith of the Church in the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist goes back to the words of Jesus himself, as recorded in the Gospel of St. John. In the Eucharistic discourse, after the multiplication of the loaves, our Lord contrasted ordinary bread with a bread that is not of this world, but that contains eternal life for those who eat it. He said, I am the bread of life. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever, and the bread I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. There is only one sacrifice, the self-giving of Christ on the cross at Calvary. The one great sacrifice was accomplished by Jesus, the priest and victim, who offered himself on the altar of the cross for our redemption. This sacrifice not only need not be repeated, but cannot be repeated. However, it can be represented so that today, in our moment in history, we are able sacramentally and spiritually to enter the Paschal Mystery and draw spiritual nourishment from it. The Church's life and development are rooted in the sacrifice of the cross, which is represented on the altar. The Church shares in the very life of the risen Lord. Its members, through baptism into the Church, form a body with Christ as its head. Eucharistic communion confirms the Church in her unity as the body of Christ. It is through this Church that men and women are saved by coming to know Jesus Christ, and through Him they are united in grace to the Father, through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. As the Pope makes clear, the mystery of the faith involves the mystery of the Eucharist and the Church. Speaking of Eucharistic adoration, the Pope writes, The worship of the Eucharist, aside from the Mass, is of inestimable value for the life of the Church. It is the responsibility of pastors to encourage, also by their personal witness, the practice of Eucharistic adoration and exposition of the Blessed Sacrament in particular. The theological logic of the encyclical unfolds in Chapter 3, The Apostolicity of the Eucharist in the Church. Here the Holy Father develops the Church's teaching on the relationship between priestly ministry and the Eucharist, and we are encouraged to reflect on how the priest, acting in the person of Christ, Persona Christi, brings about the Eucharistic sacrifice. The Eucharist, too, has its foundation in the Apostles, not in the sense that it did not originate in Christ himself, but because it was entrusted by Christ to the Apostles and has been handed down to us by them and their successors. The Eucharist is the supreme sacramental manifestation of communion in the Church, and therefore those who receive Holy Communion bear public witness that the outward bonds of communion are intact. 
We must be spiritually disposed to receive the Eucharist. Anyone conscious of a grave sin must receive the sacrament of reconciliation before coming to communion. There can be no intercommunion among those who do not share the Catholic faith. Communion in the public statement that those who receive it are incorporated into the society of the Church, who, possessing the Spirit of Christ, accept her, accept the whole structure of her, and all the means of salvation established within her and within her visible framework. The celebration of the Eucharist must be done with fitting simplicity and solemnity, and thus always in accord with the ritual of the Church. The Eucharist is the patrimony of the Church and not the private property of the celebrant, meaning the priest. The way the Eucharist is celebrated should reflect the faith and practice of the Church. At the School of Mary, Woman of the Eucharist, which is the final chapter of the Pope's encyclical, St. John Paul leads us through a beautiful reflection on Mary's faith and her spirit of praise for God, which is a model for our own attitude as we approach the Eucharist. St. John Paul brings forth his own deep and beautiful devotion to Mary, a meditation on her place in the Church and in the life of each believer. In the Eucharist, the Church is completely united to Christ and His sacrifice, and makes her own the Spirit of Mary. The Eucharist, like the canticle of Mary, is first and foremost praise and thanksgiving. St. John Paul celebrates the mystery of our faith so beautifully pro proclaimed at every Eucharistic liturgy. Jesus continues to be with us. His Eucharistic presence is the foundation of the Church and our pledge of life everlasting. How blessed we are with the gift of faith and in that faith the gift of the Eucharist. Let's digress now just a few minutes, brothers and sisters. I want to give you some information that you may want to jot down. If you're traveling and you're looking for a church in the times that Mass is celebrated, you can go to a website that's called masstimes.org. That's M-A-S-S-T-I-M-E-S, -S -S, all one word, dot org. Put in the zip code of wherever you are, and you'll get a list of nearby churches and the times that they have Mass and Confession and what have you. Another really good website is therealpresence.org. This is a magnificent website. Anything that you need to know about the Eucharist, about adoration, is in this website. They've anticipated all your questions, and all you have to do is choose a category, and you'll find out whatever it is that you've wanted to know for some time. Another is Savior.org, S-A-V-I-O-R dot O-R-G. If you go to this website, you'll be able to see Jesus, His true presence, in the monstrance. This is put there on the website by the Holy Spirit Adoration Sisters, otherwise known as the Pink Nuns, because of the color of their habit. They're right here in Philadelphia, and they've had perpetual adoration 24-7 since 1916. That's almost a hundred years. God bless them. I should mention to you that there are certain times when the picture of our Lord in the monstrance may not be available. Shortly before 6 a.m. and 7 a.m. and 8 a.m., the Good Sisters have prayer, so the picture may not be up. There's midday prayer and mid-afternoon prayer. At 5 o'clock, there's Vespers and Benediction, and there will be no picture of the Blessed Sacrament during Vespers. And then at 8 p.m., there is night prayer, Compline. So, if you don't get it as soon as you go into the website, the picture of our Lord in the Monstrance, don't give up. It'll be up very soon. And you'll be able to have Jesus keep you company, and you'll be able to keep Him company while you're sitting at your computer reading the Bible or praying the Rosary or whatever it is that you like to do. 
Now we're going to tar start talking to you about perpetual adoration. And these words are from Father John Harden, a Jesuit. And they're taken from the website we mentioned earlier, therealpresence.org. And we've gotten permission from the good folks over there to read excerpts from Father Harden's words. This is about perpetual adoration, true peace in the world. The true peace, peace about which we're speaking is peace of heart. And you and I know, brothers and sisters, that if everybody on the face of this earth had peace of heart, there would be peace of other kinds also. There would be no wars. There's no need to explain why we should talk about peace of heart if there's any single recommendation and even mandate that his followers received from Christ, it was to be at peace. Before the birth of Christ, Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied the Benedictus, which he concluded with a promise to us that the rising sun, capital S-U-N, meaning Jesus, will visit us to guide our feet into the way of peace. When Christ was born at Bethlehem, the angels sang the first Gloria and Excelsis to the shepherds, promise again of peace to men of good will. During his public life, when Christ forgave sinners and healed the sick, he told them to go in peace. Before his passion, when the Savior went over Jerusalem and wept over Jerusalem, he was overcome with sorrow because its inhabitants did not heed the things that are to your peace. And at the Last Supper, Jesus told the disciples, and through them he was telling us what we are so prone to forget, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust in me. In other words, be at peace. He also said, Peace I bequeath to you, my peace I give you, a peace the world cannot give. This is my gift to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. Then on the evening of his resurrection from the dead, Christ's first word to the frightened apostles was the command, Peace be with you, which he repeated, Peace be with you. True to the spirit of the Master, the apostles, especially St. Paul, never tired of telling the faithful, to be at peace. And finally, in the opening verse of the last book of the Bible, John pronounces the invocation, Grace and peace to you from him who is, who was, and who is to come. That is, from Jesus Christ. So the theme goes on, and so the church in her liturgy keeps praying to the Lord to give us peace. And so the heart of man keeps hungering and searching for that peace, which Christ promised to those who serve him. Now we ask, if peace of soul is such a precious commodity, is it inevitable for those who believe in God, or do we have to strive to achieve it? There seems to be no need to say what everyone knows already only too well. Peace is not automatic, even with the possession of faith, or for that matter with the possession of considerable virtue. Peace must be achieved to be acquired. It is the fruit of grace, no doubt, but also and very much the result of our cooperation with the grace we received. The most powerful means of obtaining peace of heart is from Jesus Christ in the Blessed Sacrament. What are we saying? We're saying that in order to obtain that self-mastery, which is the precondition of internal peace, we need nothing less than God's miraculous grace. Today's world is filled with so much confusion and noise that nothing less than supernatural grace can provide us with the peace of mind without which there can be no peace of heart. Where do we go? To whom do we turn? Whom do we ask to give us that peace of mind of which it's so tragically wanting in the, magic wor in the modern world? 
Who alone can give us that serenity of spirit, which is another name for peace of soul? Who but Jesus Christ, who is the Prince of Peace? We do not normally think of Christ in the Blessed Sacrament as food for the mind and the will, but we should. To be at peace, what we first need is to know the truth. What we next need to, is to do the will of God. On both counts, Jesus in the Holy Eucharist is our principal source and model. Christ could not have been plainer than when he told us to eat his body and drink his blood. He said it very plainly and he repeated it. What we may overlook, however, is that the spiritual nourishment from the Eucharist does not end with Holy Communion. There's also a nourishment that takes place in what we casually call spiritual communion. How cheap the phrase sounds! But it is neither casual nor cheap. It is deeply meaningful. As we pray before this Blessed Sacrament, our souls are fed by the person of the Savior in the two faculties of spirit that we need to be constantly fed. They are in the mind and in the will. In the mind we need light, in the will we need strength. Both needs are met in an extraordinary way through prayer before the Holy Eucharist, in front of the Holy Eucharist, in front of Jesus in the monstrance or in the tabernacle. It's not the same Christ who taught the multitude, who gave the Sermon on the Mount, and who took time, a lot of time, to tell his disciples and to further share with them the secrets that until then had been hidden from the minds of men. It is Jesus, and he is here, right now. We would not expect his lips to be sealed. He has a message to give, and we have a lot to learn. Did he not say he was the truth and the way? The truth who knows what we should know, and the way who knows how we should serve Almighty God? It is this truth and way, become incarnate, who is with us and near and available to us. All we need to do is believe sufficiently to come to him in the Blessed Sacrament and ask very simply, Lord, teach me, I am dumb. And that is no exaggeration. Your servant is listening and ready to learn. In the will, we need strength to supply for the notorious weakness that by now we know how really stupid and weak we are. What a precious secret! But again, is it not the same Christ who encouraged the disciples, who braced up the faltering Peter and promised to be with us all days? That promise is to be taken literally. He is here. Jesus is here telling us today, Peace I bequeath to you, my own peace I give you. Thank you, Lord. We sure need it. Do not let your hearts be troubled or afraid. How well you know, Lord, I am scared. Have courage, I have overcome the world. No less than then, so now Christ is not merely encouraging us in words, which we appreciate, but strengthening us with grace. His words, being those of God, are grace, and the words and the grace are once more accessible to all who come to him, as he foretold. Come to me, all you who labor and are overburdened, and I will give you strength. Jesus, that's me. But we must come to him, the Emmanuel, the God with us, in the Eucharist, to tell him what we need. And if we do, and as often as we do, he will do the rest. My friends, it's so peaceful sitting in front of Jesus in the monstrance in the Adoration Chapel or in front of the tabernacle in church before Mass, after Mass, at other times. Some people read the Bible or a religious or spiritual book. Others pray the rosary. 
Others just look at him and know that he's looking at you. Others sit there and to themselves they say, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. It isn't necessary, if you don't feel like it, to talk to God. He knows your words before you even form them in your mind. But being there is being with Him. And being with Him is the same as praying to Him. So when we're in front of Christ, as long as it's respectful, we can do whatever we like. And He will love us all the more for it. My friends, here is an excerpt taken from the talk that Pope John Paul II gave at Phoenix Park in his visit to Ireland from September 29th to October 1st in 1979. I wish to recall to you an important truth affirmed by the Second Vatican Council, namely, the spiritual life nevertheless is not confined to participation in the liturgy. I encourage you in the other exercises of devotion that you have lovingly preserved for centuries, especially those in regard to the Blessed Sacrament. These acts of piety honor God and are useful, very useful, for our Christian lives. They give joy to our hearts and help us to appreciate the more liturgical worship of the Church. The visit to the Blessed Sacrament is a great treasure of the Catholic faith. It nourishes social love and gives us opportunities for adoration and thanksgiving, for reparation and supplication. Benediction of the Blessed Sacrament, exposition and adoration of the Blessed Sacrament, holy hours, and Eucharistic processions are likewise precious elements of your heritage, in full accord with the teaching of the Second Vatican Council. And so, dear brothers and sisters, every act of reverence, every genuflection that you make before the Blessed Sacrament is important because it's an act of faith in Christ, an act of love for Christ. And every sign of the cross and gesture of respect made each time you pass a church is also an act of faith. May God preserve you in this faith, this holy Catholic faith, this faith in the Blessed Sacrament. I just want to mention, ladies and gentlemen, once again about Eucharistic adoration sitting in front of Jesus, either in the monstrance in a adoration chapel or in the tabernacle in church. The more quiet we are, the more we can clear our minds of clutter and of noise, of the things that we have to do that day, the things that we're worried about. Just for a few moments, if we can just put that aside and leave it outside the door, the more quiet and content and peaceful we are, the more Jesus will speak to us. It may not be in an audible voice, but he will talk to us. And we will know by the time we leave his presence that he has spoken to us. In fact, by the time we're ready to leave, we'll probably think to ourselves, I wish it were time to come back again and be with my Jesus. I know that he loves me when I look at him. I see him looking at me, and I know how much I love him. Praise God. Jesus in the Eucharist, Please take care of us, watch over us, and give us everything that we need in order to love you more and to bring you to everyone whom we meet. We'll see you next time, brothers and sisters. Tune in again next week. We want to be with you. We love you. God bless. 